Hello everyone, welcome to the Learning Theater at GDC 2024. My name is Lucas Bilodeau, I'm a senior game designer over at Psyonix, and today I'm gonna to give you a demo on how you can create your own rocket racing tracks within UEFN. This is gonna be a demo done on live, so this is live UEFN. You can go home, install UEFN, and do this yourself whenever you want. So if something goes wrong, it's a live demo. So we're gonna create a new project, and like any new project in UEFN, we're gonna start in the project browser. Within the project browser, if you're familiar with UEFN, you'll notice something new here. Under the island templates category, there is a rocket racing category with two new island templates, a competitive racetrack and a speed run track. We're gonna make a competitive racetrack today during this demo. There's a docs link for you to get started and learn the ins and outs of how these devices and templates work. I'm gonna leave revision control and UEFN teams alone, and I'm gonna leave my project name alone. I'm just gonna hit create. Now, something to get in the mindset of as this loads in, a lot of times in UEFN, when you're creating new projects, you're making entirely new games. Maybe you're exploring, revolutionizing a genre. Some of the talks that you may have seen here talk about how to make completely unique experiences. The track uh, templates here are for creating rocket racing tracks specifically. So when you publish them, they'll end up in uh, Discover and you can play them in rocket racing. So th think of these more as a uh, track creation tool than a game creation tool. I will cover away at the very end that we are trying to unlock the ability to allow people to create their own vehicle-based experiences, but for now, we're just gonna get back into track creation. This is the starting area of our template. We put it together in a way to kind of streamline your ability to jump in and start building and iterate rapidly for creating tracks in rocket racing. We've got a basic landscape in the back here and water volume. You can use it to build the environment around your track when you're happy with it, or you can delete it and do something completely different. Totally up to you. As far as the devices that we have placed along our start line area here, there's a number that we should go over. So over here, we've got a HUD controller device. This is an already existing device in UEFN. We use this to hide a lot of the Fortnite Battle Royale HUD because it's not relevant within the context of rocket racing. We have our own custom HUD. We've got a race manager device here, and this is what sets up your, uh, your game to run as a competitive race. And in rocket racing, that means 12 players racing against each other to complete all of the laps, and everybody's got collision with one another, and it's chaos and all kinds of fun. We've got a number of player start positions here to facilitate those spawners for the 12 players who can be in the mode. And we've got a couple checkpoints here. This is our start line checkpoint, or the first one that players will hit on a lap. And this is our finish line checkpoint, or the final one players would hit on their lap. I could launch session here, and this would run, but it would be quite boring. All you would do is drive to this finish line checkpoint, we'd teleport you back to the start, you'd do that three times in the race over, not a whole lot to look at. So let's actually make a track here ourselves. Last thing to cover is kind of the meat and potatoes of track creation. This is what we call our rocket racing track device. It is a spline editing tool that lofts meshes along that spline. So as you deform it or extend it or twist it, bend it, scale it, the track will follow suit and let you make some pretty complex shapes. Now, before we jump into this completely, when I go to click on a node or the spline itself, it pops open what we call our style editor window. This is a companion to the track device and surfaces a lot of commonly used actions that you might have while you're building out your track. We'll come back to this a little bit later, but we'll get, we'll get in more depth with it then. So I'm gonna start blocking out my track. There's a couple things I'm gonna change here. I'm gonna up my grid snapping real big. And I'm also gonna go into top down. So I make my grid snapping very large because if you've played rocket racing, the cars are very, very fast. So I like to have a much larger grid snap when I'm getting the rough shape of my track just to make sure that I'm not placing things too close together or in a way that the super quick cars are not gonna be able to navigate it. I like to use top-down view because it also helps me get a better sense of scale and flow of the track. You don't have to do this. You can work in perspective view if you would rather. This is just how I prefer to do it. I'm gonna select this last node along the spline. And when I do, you're gonna notice the pivot point here of our, uh, of our widget moves. So that's a good indicator that you've actually selected the point. I'm gonna hold left alt 
and I'm gonna drag away from that node. And so we've created a new node along our spline and we've extended the spline a little bit longer. And we're gonna use this method right now and I'm just gonna do a rough block out of a basic track using this method all the way through. For a lot of you who have used uh, UE or UEFN and messed with splines before, a lot of what I'm gonna go over in the next couple minutes is gonna be pretty familiar to you. You'll just get to see it within the context of rocket racing and the track editing. I also realize that the spline is not super pretty to look at as I'm doing the block at this basic block out, but we'll go back through and clean this stuff up when we get a chance. So like I said, I'm just kind of going through adding nodes to the end of my spline and getting a rough shape that seems like it might be interesting to play through. So I'm gonna add another hairpin here. I'm gonna start working my, whoops, I'm gonna start working my way back north. And I think I want a nice long meandering turn back toward the finish here. So I'm gonna start bending this way and I'm gonna add another node here and maybe one more leading back toward the start line. Now, I want this to be a circuit track. I want this track to loop. The way you do this is once you've got this, this finish point and closer to where your, your spline started, you can go to our style editor widget, go to the device tab. This tab surfaces device wide user options for the track. Uh, and I'm gonna go in here and use looping track. When I check this, it's gonna bridge the gap from that last node that I've created back to my first node at the start line. And it's gonna loop this. If you've used spline components before, it's a lot like using closed loop. So I'm gonna check this box and it's gonna bridge the gap for us and generate the track as needed. So that's cool, we've got a looping track. It's a full circuit, but it's pretty ugly to look at. So let's go through and clean it up. A lot of what I'm doing here is just gonna use the other transform widgets that exist in UEFN. So I can hit the E key to rotate nodes and it'll adjust the track there. So I'm gonna straighten this out just a little bit. I'm gonna go back here. I'm gonna hit the R key and then I'm gonna scale in the forward direction of the track and this allows you to extend the arrive and leave tangent at that node and it effectively makes your turns wider. So you can hit W to move back to your node placement. I'm gonna drop my grid down now. I've got my basic shape and I wanna get a little more exact with this. So I'm just gonna adjust my nodes using these methods and try and get a nice kind of smooth track all the way around. I kind of want this to be a little less extreme. On this hairpin, I'm gonna straighten out the nodes on the entry and exit to kind of align with how you enter and exit the turn. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna scale this up a little bit in the forward direction so it's a little less sharp an angle. So pretty basic controls, not a whole lot of magic happening here. But pretty quickly we can get a pretty clean rough shape of our track without having to get, do anything outside of basic spline editing controls and using these widgets. I'm gonna scale this up a little bit as well. So now we have a nice rounded hairpin here. So pretty quickly, we got, a, we got a nice clean track shape, a little more even, less janky to look at, but it's boring. If I go back to perspective view, there's not a lot going on here. It's a pretty flat track. So you might be able to play through it. It might be interesting for a lap or two, but there's a lot more with spline editing that we can do to add some complexity to your track. So I'm gonna select this node here. I'm gonna hold control to add to my selection. And I'm gonna select a bunch of the nodes around this turn. I'm gonna hit W, ooh, I unselected. You're gonna see me do something for the sake of speed. Easy. We'll get into that a little bit later. I'll tell you how that actually works. Uh, I'm gonna move these nodes down till they're almost right on the water, right? So you can pretty quickly add some basic elevation changes to your track. So let's say we wanna go over here and we want this half of the track to start working its way upward. So I'm gonna drag these nodes up to kind of create this incline and I'm gonna have it slowly start to work its way back down toward the start line area of my track. Move this guy up just a little bit and I'm gonna rotate these nodes so that I get a nice even sort of incline along the spline. You don't necessarily have to do this if you want it to be more stepped for what you're building, you can do that. I just like them to be a little bit smoother. So pretty quickly we've added some elevation changes, but there's a few more things with spline editing with the track tool that we can do as well. So if I come over here and I select this node, let's say you had a gameplay section here where you wanna place a bunch of obstacles, you want players to have to dodge between things to catch boost pads, and you need a little bit more space to facilitate that gameplay. You can switch to scale and you can scale the track up to increase its width, right? So you can do this at 
really any point to give yourself a little bit more space to play with if you need it. Finally, we should cover rotation, because all you could really see with rotation from the top-down view was that we can, twist, uh, we can twist the nodes like this, right? There's a few more axes that you can use to your advantage to create more complex shapes. So I can rotate this way to add some undulation to the track, or I can rotate this way to have my turn bank inward or outward. So let's have a real sharp inward bank, and then we're gonna move this up so it's just out of the water. And now we've, had a couple, we've added a couple of more complex line bits to our track. And it's a looking a little bit more interesting. But there's one last thing we should cover before we try and see how this plays. And that's our style editor widget. I mentioned earlier I'd come back to it, and I'm gonna do it now. We talked a bit about the device tab. Device-wide options are surfaced here for you. The track tab surfaces information context sensitive to whatever your currently selected node or nodes are. So right now it's grayed out, there's not a lot to look at, can't interact with it very much, but if I select a node along our track spline, a lot of it'll light up. Now you can interact with these options, and some even show up. So under selected points, this is surfacing something that those of you who have used the spline component once again are probably familiar with. This is the general transform controls of that node as well as the arrive and leave tangent. So if you want to get super exact with how your node is placed and, and pixel perfect with where it is, you can use this and it's a little bit easier to do that. We have a road options section. This is rocket racing specific controls. So these affect either the gameplay or the visuals of your track relative to things that exist within rocket racing. I'm not going to get too super deep into these. Check out the documentation for more information on that part, but I do want to cover the road style section here. So this allows you to override the actual shape and look of your track at a given node or your currently selected nodes. So there's a number of different road shape options, and I can click these little modals to, to filter this list. So we have a pipe, we have a couple of tunnels, we have a half pipe, a banked road, and a flat road. If you've played rocket racing, you have probably seen a version of these in any number of maps, right? We use these internally. What we're doing right now is very, very close to what our level designers do in-house to create tracks, right? So, there's also an option all the way to the left here called None. And if you select this, it will simply not generate a mesh from that node to the next node. This is great for creating gaps if you want to have jumps in your track. It's a very easy way to do that very quickly. So if I come over here and I decide that I want to jump, I can create a gap here. And I want this to be a little more extreme. I'm going to have this turn upward a little bit. And now the approach to this feels a little more treacherous. And we've got a cool jump. But like I said, you can override the actual shapes of the road as well. So if I select this node here, and I go to the banked road section, and I choose this first option, it's going to override the shape of the road there to use this banked shape. And it'll automatically insert a transition mesh between varying shapes to ensure that it's nice and smooth. So I'm going to continue that banked shape all the way through this turn by selecting these nodes and applying that shape. And there we go. Now this hairpin's using a totally different shape of road. Sometimes you want to change a large swath of your track. You want a big old change and, a, and the second half of it to just be totally different. I'm going to select this node, and I could control click and select the, the, the rest of the nodes again, but I used this earlier, and we should touch on it now. We do surface the selected spline points widget that you would see in the spline component. And this offers you a way to easily select different nodes along your spline. So you can select the last node on the spline, the first node on the spline, all the nodes on the spline. We're going to use this button right here that adds the next node to the current selection. So I'm going to press this just a couple times. That seems good. And all the ones that are highlighted yellow are now selected. I'm going to come over here, and I want this last section of my track to be made up of just a pipe shape. And you can override a big section of your track, and now you're using that shape. It inserts our transition meshes as necessary, and that's all good to go. You'll also notice that where we scaled up our road here is also preserved when you, when you change the road shape. So instead of being a perfectly circular pipe, we've got more of an oval feel here inside. So there you have it. That's kind of the, the power of the road style section in the style editor widget. There's more to do here. We could get a lot more complex with our splines if we wanted to. But for the sake of the demo, I think our track's looking pretty interesting, especially compared to when we came back to perspective view and it was just kind of a flat thing. But there's one more thing we got to do before we can test this, and that's update our checkpoints. So let's do that now. Because we have a circuit track, and the track loops back on itself, 
your start line and your finish line need to be the same checkpoint. It's pretty easy to update it. Underneath the user options, this has already got start line checked. I'm gonna check finish line, and now this checkpoint is both our start line and our finish line. It's that easy. I'm gonna delete this finish line, our old finish line. It's gonna ask me if I'm okay with removing some references, and that's totally fine. And I'm gonna grab this prop that I had placed here, and I'm gonna move it over to our new finish line position. It's a good signifier of when somebody's coming to the end of a lap. And then we can need to add additional checkpoints. So I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna search for checkpoints. Whoops. Maybe I'll search for a rocket racing checkpoint. And I'm gonna drag that into our scene. I'm gonna go back to top down view to place these. But what's important to understand about checkpoints is it's your primary way of enforcing a particular flow through your track. This is how you ensure that players visit specific areas as they're navigating through the space. So I'm gonna do something slightly wrong here and explain why it's wrong for the design that I'm going for. So let's imagine we had our checkpoints set up like this. I'm gonna map them together in a second, but if I did, you hit this checkpoint first, you come around, you hit this one on this turn, and then you catch this one, but the next active one is gonna be this guy. For those of you who've played Rocket Racing, you probably already know the problem. There's a high degree of mobility inside Rocket Racing. I promise you, it is very, very easy to hit this checkpoint, jump off the track, fly over here to this one, and continue on. So this is where using checkpoints to enforce a specific track flow is important. So if I just create another checkpoint and I bring it down here toward the apex of this turn, now players are gonna have to go down there and visit that section before they move on to that checkpoint. But I have to define how these things are tied together. I'm gonna come back to perspective view and just adjust the height of the checkpoints that I placed in top down. And then we're gonna map these checkpoints together and basically tell them, hey, what order do you have to hit these in when you're going through? I'm gonna start with the start line checkpoint. There's an option here called next checkpoints. It's an array. I'm gonna add an element to that array. I'm gonna use the dropper and I'm gonna select the next checkpoint I want players to have to visit. And then I'm gonna select that checkpoint and do the same thing pointing to the next one. And I'm gonna do this all the way through the lap until a checkpoint has pointed back to our finish line, which, reminder, is also our start line checkpoint. So there you have it. We've mapped together. Now we've defined an order that players have to proceed through this. We've updated our track. We've got some interesting stuff going on. So let's play it. I'm gonna launch session. While this goes, I wanna cover a couple of things. Before we get too far away from the topic of checkpoints, I did mention that next checkpoints is an array. This does mean you can have multiple next checkpoints. If you want your track to split or branch, you can set up multiple next checkpoints at the checkpoint just before the branch and point it at the first checkpoints along either path and have those branch that way. Your paths will have to come back at some point, either at the finish line or before the finish line, because you can only have one finish line checkpoint in rocket racing which is a good segue into the other thing I wanted to cover while this loads. There are validation checks that are happening using these devices in these templates. So we want to ensure a, ensure a base functionality when you publish these tracks. So you can be confident that when you publish them, the tracks are going to behave as you expect. And to accomplish this, uh, some of what we've done is with validation checks. So for example, if you try to launch session, upload to a private version, or publish your track, so if you try to play or publish your track, these validation checks are gonna happen, and if you had more than one finish line or no finish lines, it would give you an appropriate error, tell you what went wrong, and then you can go back and fix that. A lot of these validation checks are also covered in our documentation for the individual devices, so if you're ever stuck or have questions on that, it's a good place to start to try and get some answers. But we do this for a couple of other things too, like you gotta have 12 start positions on the start line, right? If you delete all your start positions and there's only one start position and you try and spawn 12 players with collision in the same position, you're gonna have a really bad time with it. So this is almost done here. I don't know how many of you are familiar with UEFN, but we're, we're launching an edit session now. So as we connect to this session, it's gonna drop me directly into the vehicle because I had uh, start session on load set. So it has put me in the rocket racing vehicle and I now have control of the vehicle. The changes to my track are here and I can drive around the track, navigate through the checkpoints and proceed all the way through. Ooh, that's really on the water. Almost closer than I meant it to be. And all of this works as it should. Those of you who have played rocket racing might notice something or a few things missing here. 
Some of our HUD is not here. There is no lap counter in the top left. There is no player placement tracker in the top left. There are certain gameplay systems here that are, are, that are normally in Rocket Racing that are not running here. This is really to give you a chance to play your track, get a feel for it, see if it's working out for you, if the turns feel good, if the gaps feel like they're a good length, if you're framing things the way that you wanna frame them through a lap, all of that stuff. But when you publish this, and this is ready to publish, we did pass the validation check. When you publish it, it'll be added to Discover. You can go in, find these tracks, play them with your friends, and it will be running in Rocket Racing. That means all of the custom HUD and all of the gameplay systems running underneath the hood will be there. They will function like the first party Rocket Racing tracks do. So we've built a basic track, but there's a lot of stuff that we haven't even touched here, right? There's a handful of devices that we haven't used. Uh, there's, we haven't placed any additional track devices. We haven't done any split paths or alternate routes. We haven't done anything with the environment. There's a lot more that you can do with these tools to create stuff that's uh, at a level very close to or at first party content that exists in Rocket Racing right now. If that's not incentive enough, these are islands in UEFN created and, and published to Fortnite. They are eligible for the engagement payout program and Rocket Racing has millions of players coming through every week. So also a very good reason to get in and check it out. One other thing I wanted to cover, I told you guys at the end, I would let you know a way that you could make your own vehicle type experiences if you didn't wanna be building tracks for Rocket Racing. We just released alongside this back on Wednesday, the Rocket Racing Vehicle Spawner. So the Vehicle Spawner has 30 or 40 tunable knobs on it related to Rocket Racing mechanics. So you can change all sorts of things. It is the most customizable Vehicle Spawner that exists in the ecosystem right now and is probably the most powerful starting point you have to start exploring making your own games, whether they're racing games or something completely different. Those are available in both UEFN and Fortnite Creative outside of these templates. So. Do with that what you will, have fun with it. Thanks for checking out the demo and hopefully we we'll see you guys on the track. Thanks.